what is infinity? It's a, it's a simple question, but the, the answer isn't simple at all. It's not a number. You can't write it down. You can't reach it. It's more of an idea. It's a concept that has confused and fascinated people for thousands of years. It's a playground for mathematicians and a source of wonder for the rest of us. Let's start with the feeling of it. You've probably felt it. You look up at the night sky, you see all those stars, and you think, how far does that go? You know, does it just stop? Like, if it stops, like, what's on the other side of the stop? A wall. And what's behind the wall? The questions just keep coming. Your mind can't find a comfortable place to land. That feeling of endlessness, of something that goes on forever and ever, that's your first brush with infinity. Or think about numbers. You learn to count as a kid. One, two, three. You're proud when you hit ten. Then a hundred. Then a thousand. At some point, you ask your parents, what's the biggest number? They might say a million or, or a billion, but you know, deep down, you can always add one more. There is no biggest number. The process of counting can go on forever. That's another glimpse of infinity. It's not a destination. It's the road that never ends. Time is another one. Will tomorrow ever stop coming? It's hard to imagine. We think of forever in stories and songs, a love that lasts forever. A promise for all time. We use the word casually, but the idea behind it is massive. Uh, a timeline that stretches forward without any end point. It's the same looking backward. Before you were born, before your parents were born, before there were people, how far back does it go? Did it all just start one day? If so, what was there the day before it started? Again, our brains hit a wall. That wall is where we feel the presence of infinity. These are the intuitive ideas of infinity. It's about being boundless, endless, limitless. For a long time, this was all it was. A fuzzy, philosophical concept. Something for poets and thinkers to wonder about. The ancient Greeks, for example, were brilliant mathematicians, but they were deeply uncomfortable with infinity. Uh, they liked things to be neat, finite, and measurable. To them, infinity was a sign of chaos, of something unfinished and imperfect. Um, they called it apiarn, which meant unbounded or indefinite, and they didn't like it. A Greek philosopher named Zeno of Alea came up with some famous paradoxes to show just how weird infinity was. His most famous one is about a race between the hero Achilles and a slow tortoise. The tortoise gets a head start. Zeno argued that Achilles could never, ever catch the tortoise. Here's why. By the time Achilles reaches the spot where the tortoise started, the tortoise has moved a little bit forward. So Achilles has to run to that new spot, but in the time it takes him to do that, the tortoise has crawled a tiny bit further. So Achilles runs to that new spot, and again, the tortoise has moved forward again. This process repeats. The distance between them gets smaller and smaller, but Achilles always has some small distance left to cover. And he has to complete an infinite number of smaller and smaller tasks to catch up. Zeno's point was that this is impossible. You can't complete an infinite number of tasks. Of course, we know in real life, Achilles would blow past the tortoise. So what's going on? Zeno's paradox highlights a deep confusion. It pits our real-world experience against a seemingly logical argument. The problem lies in how we think about adding up an infinite number of things. It feels like an infinite number of small distances should add up to an infinite total distance. But they don't. They, they add up to a finite, specific distance. This is a key idea that took mathematicians centuries to figure out. They needed a new tool. That tool would eventually become calculus, which is built on the idea of handling an infinite number of infinitesimally small things. Aristotle, another Greek philosopher, tried to clean up the mess. He made a very useful distinction. He said there are two kinds of infinity, potential, infinity and actual infinity. Potential infinity is the kind we're comfortable with. It's a process. The counting numbers are a good example. You can always count one more. The process of counting can potentially go on forever. You'll never run out of numbers. A line segment is also potentially infinite in this way. You can always divide it in half, and then divide that half in half. You can keep dividing it forever. There's no smallest piece. It's a never-ending procedure. Actual infinity is different. This is the idea of infinity as a real existing thing, a completed object. It's not a process, but a result. An actually infinite set would be a collection that contains an infinite number of things, all at once. For example, the set of all the counting numbers, not just the process of counting them, but the whole collection, sitting there as one thing. Aristotle rejected this idea completely. He thought it was absurd. How can something be complete and endless at the same time? It seemed like a contradiction. For almost 2,000 years, this was the accepted view. 
Infinity was a potential, not an actuality. It was a useful idea for describing processes, but not a real mathematical object you could work with. Talking about an actual infinity was like talking about a square circle. It just didn't make sense. And then, in the late 1800s, a German mathematician named George Cantor came along and changed everything. He wasn't afraid of infinity. He looked it right in the eye. Uh, and he discovered things that are still shocking to think about today. Cantor is the person who truly gave us a language to talk about infinity. He gave us a way to tame it. Cantor's big idea was to use sets. A set is just a collection of things. The set of fruits in a bowl. The set of people in a room. The set of letters in the alphabet. Simple. He then asked a very simple question, how do you know if two sets are the same size? For small sets, you just count them. Three apples, three oranges. Same size. But what if the sets are huge? Or what if they're infinite? You can't count them. Cantor's brilliant insight was that you don't need to count. You just need to pair things up. Imagine a dance hall full of people. You want to know if there's an equal number of men and women. You could count all the men, then count all the women. Or you could just ask everyone to find a partner. If every man has a female partner and every woman has a male partner and no one is left standing alone, then you know the two groups are the same size. You don't need to know the actual number. This idea of one-to-one -one correspondence is the key. Cantor applied this simple idea to infinite sets, and that's when things got weird. He started with a set of counting numbers. These are also called the natural numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. This set is obviously infinite. He then looked at another set, the set of all even numbers 2, 4, 6, 8, and so on. Now, which set is bigger? Your intuition screams that the set of counting numbers is bigger. It has to be. It contains all the even numbers, plus all the odd numbers. It seems like it should be twice as big. But Cantor said, let's try to pair them up. Like the dancers in the hall, he paired each counting number with its double, and so on. You can see that this can go on forever. Every single counting number has exactly one even number partner. And every single even number has exactly one counting number partner. There's no one left over on either side. According to the dance hall rule, this means the two sets are the same size. Let that sink in. The set of all counting numbers is the same size as the set of all even numbers. An infinite set can be the same size as a part of itself. This is something that's impossible for finite sets. Uh, if you take some apples out of a basket, you have fewer apples. But with infinity, you can take away an infinite number of things, the odd numbers, and still have the same amount left over. This property is now one of the definitions of an infinite set. Cantor called this size of infinity countable infinity. It doesn't mean you can actually finish counting it. It means you can, in principle, create a list. You can put the elements in order, first, second, third, and so on, and eventually get to any element on the list. The even numbers are countable. The odd numbers are countable. Even the set of all fractions is countable. This seems even more impossible. There are an infinite number of fractions between 0 and 1 alone. But Cantor found a clever way to list them all, proving that the set of all fractions is the same size as the set of counting numbers. He gave this first level of infinity a name, Aleph Null, or zero. Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. This was the first transfinite number, a number beyond the finite. For a while, people thought this was the end of the story. Okay, infinity is weird, but at least there's only one of it. The size of all the simple infinite sets we can think of is Aleph Null. But Cantor didn't stop there. He asked another question. Are there sets that are even bigger than this? Is there an infinity that is so large it's not countable? An infinity whose members you can't line up and list, even in principle. He found one. It was the set of all real numbers. The real numbers are all the numbers on the number line. This includes the whole numbers 1, 2, 3, the fractions like 1, 2, or 3, 4, and the irrational numbers like pi, or the square root of 2, which are decimals that go on forever without repeating. And Cantor proved that this set is bigger than the set of counting numbers. He proved that Aleph Null is not the only infinity. And the way he proved it is one of the most beautiful and mind-bending arguments in all of mathematics. It's called Cantor's Diagonal Argument. It works like this. Imagine you could make a list of all the real numbers between 0 and 1. Just for a moment, let's assume it's possible. Your list would be infinitely long, but the idea is that every single real number between 0 and 1 is on that list somewhere. So number 1, 0 0.1234567. Number 2, 0 0.8888888. Number 3, 0 0.5000000. 
number 4, 0.7654321, and so on forever. Now Cantor says I can create a new number that is not on your list. No matter how you made your list, I can find a number that you missed. This would prove that your list is incomplete, and therefore it's impossible to make a complete list. Here's how he builds his new number. He goes down the diagonal of the list, he takes the first digit from the first number, the second digit from the second number, the third from the third, and so on. From our example list, the first digit of the first number is 1, the second digit of the second number is 8. The third digit of the third number is 0, the fourth digit of the fourth number is 4, uh, and so on. So the diagonal gives us a sequence of digits 1, 8, 0, 4, dash 2. Now, he creates his new number by changing each of these digits. The rule is simple. If the digit is a 1, change it to a 2. If it's anything else, change it to a 1. It doesn't really matter how you change them, as long as you change them to something different. Using this rule, our first digit was 1, so we change it to 2. Our second digit was 8, so we change it to 1. Our third digit was 0, so we change it to 1. Our fourth digit was 4, so we change it to 1. So the new number starts with 0 0.2111. Now let's look at this new number. Is it on the list? It can't be the first number on the list because it has a different first digit. Therefore, this new number is not on the list. But we started by assuming we had a list of all the real numbers. Well, we just created a real number that isn't on the list. This is a contradiction. The only way to resolve the contradiction is to admit that our initial assumption was wrong. It is impossible to make a list of all the real numbers. This means the set of real numbers cannot be put into a one-to-one -one correspondence with the counting numbers. It's a bigger infinity. It is uncountable. This was a bombshell. It meant there isn't just one infinity. There are different sizes of infinity. There is an entire hierarchy of them. Aleph null zero is the first level. The infinity of the real numbers, which Cantor called the continuum, is a larger infinity, which we might call Aleph 1-1. And you can use similar methods to show that there are even bigger infinities beyond that. You can have an infinity of infinities. This was too much for many mathematicians of his time. They, they attacked his work. They called it mathematical insanity. One prominent mathematician called it a grave disease infecting the discipline. Cantor's ideas were so radical, so counterintuitive, that people thought he was crazy. The constant criticism took a toll on him, and he suffered from depression for much of his life. But he was right. His work on set theory is now a fundamental pillar of modern mathematics. He showed us that the world of numbers is far bigger and stranger than anyone had ever imagined. So what does all this mean for us in the real world? Is this just a game for mathematicians? Not at all. Infinity is hiding everywhere. Calculus, which is the mathematical language of change, is built on infinity. When you want to find the exact slope of a curve at a single point, you do it by looking at the slope between two points that are infinitesimally close to each other. Uh, when you want to find the area under that curve, you do it by adding up an infinite number of rectangles that are infinitesimally thin. Without a way to handle infinity, we wouldn't be able to model planetary orbits, design bridges, understand fluid dynamics, or create the computer graphics you see in movies and video games. How to calculus tame Zeno's paradox and put infinity to work. Physics is full of it. Cosmologists debate whether the universe itself is finite or infinite in size. We don't know the answer. If it's infinite, that means there's an infinite amount of space, an infinite number of galaxies. It also means that, somewhere out there, any possible configuration of atoms is likely to exist. There could be another you, living a slightly different life. That's, that's a staggering thought. Inside black holes, our current theories predict a singularity, a point of infinite density, and zero volume. This is likely a sign that our theories are incomplete, that we need a better way to describe what happens when a huge amount of matter is crushed into a tiny space. Quantum mechanics talks about an infinite number of possibilities, or an infinite number of dimensions in a conceptual space called Hilbert space. Even in our technology, infinity makes an appearance. In computer science, a common bug is an infinite loop, where a program gets stuck doing the same thing over and over again, forever. The concept of computability, what a computer can and cannot do, is deeply tied to infinity. Alan Turing, the father of modern computing, explored the halting problem, which asks if it's possible to write a program that can determine whether any other program will finish or run forever. He proved it's impossible. This sets a fundamental limit on what we can know with computers, a limit that stems directly from the nature of infinity. Art and design play with infinity, too. Think of a fractal. 
A fractal is a shape that has infinite detail. You can zoom in on a piece of a fractal and you'll see a smaller version of the whole shape. You can zoom in again and, and you'll see it again. It's, it's a pattern that repeats forever at smaller and smaller scales. Nature is full of fractal-like patterns, the branching of trees, the shape of a coastline, the structure of a snowflake. These are finite objects that give us a powerful visual metaphor for infinity. They pack an endless amount of complexity into a limited space. So, after all this, what is infinity? It's not one thing. It's a family of ideas. It's a direction, not a destination. It's the and then that never stops. It's the plus one that's always available. This is the potential infinity of Aristotle, the one we feel when we look at the stars or count numbers. It's also a size. It's a way of describing how big some collections are. And thanks to Cantor, we know that not all infinities are the same size. There are stairs in the house of the infinite. Some are just bigger than others. This is the actual infinity that so many people found disturbing. It's a real mathematical object, as solid and rigorous as the number two, just much, much weirder. It's a, it's a tool, it's a concept we use in calculus and physics to solve very practical, real-world problems. It helps us model the world around us. By embracing the idea of the infinitely small and the infinitely large, we have been able to describe motion, gravity, and change with incredible precision. And finally, it's a mirror. It shows us the limits of our own minds. We are finite beings. We live finite lives. Our brains evolve to deal with finite problems, like finding food and avoiding predators. We are not built to intuitively grasp the concept of forever, or a completed infinite set. It breaks our common sense, it forces us to rely on pure logic and abstraction, following the rules wherever they lead, even when the destination seems absurd. When we try to think about infinity, we are pushing at the very edges of what it means to think. It's a humbling experience. It reminds us that reality is under no obligation to make sense to our monkey brains. The universe is what it is, and our intuition is just one limited tool for understanding it. The journey to understand infinity is a story about human curiosity. It starts with a childlike sense of wonder, gets tangled up in philosophical paradoxes, and then blossoms into one of the most profound and beautiful creations of the human intellect. But it never loses that initial sense of mystery. We can write down the symbol for it. We can give its different sizes names, like Aleph Newell. We can use it in our equations. We have, in a sense, tamed it. But we can never truly hold it, or see it, or count it. It will always remain just beyond our grasp. It's the ultimate horizon, and maybe that's the point. It's the idea that there is always something more. Always another number. Always another star. Always another question to ask. Infinity is not the answer. It is the never-ending question.